from the headquarters of Talisio English in Quito, Ecuador. This is from the South, and I am Sweeney Gray. Julian Assange has been denied access to communications while inside the Ecuadorian embassy in London. Authorities say Assange, who was given asylum in 2012, did not comply with a request to refrain from sending messages that could be seen as interference in other states' matters. They said Assange's social media messages jeopardize the good relationship between Ecuador and Britain. And the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Human Mobility, Maria Fernanda Espinosa, announced the Foreign Ministry plans to hold a meeting in London with Assange's lawyers next week to explore additional sanctions against him. Espinosa says what's most important is that Ecuador maintains a dialogue with the United Kingdom to find a solution to the situation they inherited. And the former Prime Minister of Greece, Yanis Varoufakis, and musician Brian Eno have issued a joint statement in support of Assange. The post on Varoufakis' website expresses their concern that Assange has lost access to the internet and the right to receive visitors. They say only extraordinary pressure from the U.S. and Spanish governments could explain why Ecuador would take such steps. And our correspondent in London, Pablo Navarrete, explains why the Ecuadorian government has taken this action. It says that it, it is looking at, um, it's not closed to the idea of further measures, given that it claims a uh, agreement was made between Mr. Assange and the Ecuadorian uh, government to refrain from making statements that could prejudice uh, Ecuador's relationships with other countries. Uh, specifically, um, Mr. Assange has made uh, a number of critical comments regarding the UK government's positions um, in the aftermath of the uh, poisoning of the Ru ex-Russian spy Sergei Skripal and his daughter in the British city of Salisbury on the 4th of March. Uh, so Assange has made critical uh, statements with regards to the UK government and these, uh, these moves by the Ecuadorian government come as, as a response to this. There have been reactions around the world, including uh, by the ex-Minister of Finance of Greece, Yanis Varoufakis, who claims, um, who has argued that Ecuador should restore these communications to Mr. Assange and that as an Ecuadorian citizen, uh, something that the Ecuadorian government granted him in December 2017, he has the full, he should have the right to um, freedom of expression and therefore to use social media. It is worth remembering that the UN has um, declared that uh, Mr. Assange's detention in the, um, is in the, um, the Ecuadorian embassy in London is um, unreasonable and arbitrary detention. Um, and Mr. Assange claims he is um, there to avoid persecution and extradition to the US uh, for what he claims would be a political persecution on the basis of his work as WikiLeaks in disclosing US government um, uh, leaks. We thank Pablo Navarrete for that report. The Ecuadorian Public Security Council has met with President Lenin Moreno to discuss the situation on the border with Colombia. This follows the kidnapping of two journalists and their driver on the border. Vigils have been held in several Ecuadorian cities to ask for their release. Over 200 Ecuadorian journalists have signed a petition urging the government to guarantee the safety of the journalists and asking the kidnappers to release their colleagues. The manifesto was given to the Ecuadorian Vice President, Maria Alejandra Vicuña, who attended the vigil in Quito. And in another violent incident in Ecuador, the head of the woman's prison in the coastal city of Guayaquil has been murdered. 46-year-old Gavis Glenda Moreno was shot multiple times on Tuesday. The attack happened while she was traveling with her driver in a white pickup truck. Authorities say she was trailed by, the mot by a motorcycle from the time she left the prison. According to local reports, at least eight shots were fired. Police say this was a targeted attack and they are investigating the case. And our correspondent, Denise Herrera, has more on the growing concerns about insecurity in Ecuador. 
The director of the women's prison in Guayaquil in the Ecuadorian coast was assassinated on Tuesday night. The National Office of Homicide, Disappearance, Extortion and Kidnapping, the Dina said, confirmed the death. The director and her driver was murdered after they left the prison where they work. The authorities also announced that an investigation is currently underway. This tragedy follows an unusual activities, violent uh, attacks in the Ecuadorian border. The, in a press conference, the Interior Minister Cesar Navas joined with the Defense Minister Patricio Zambrano. The police and the armed forces and the armed forces confirmed the kidnapping of two journalists and, and their driver working for the commercial newspaper. The journalist and the driver had disappeared near to the Colombia border. In Mataje, in the in the in the Esmeraldas province, uh, many uh, several authorities expressed messages to support as the Ecuadorian journalists who made a call to the to the to the support to the uh, mixed journalists and their family also gather outside the government palace. In the press conference also the interior minister says that Navar announced a new security measures and had made a call to the public security council of the of the country which is the highest a con a secu a public security council in the country and which is formed with the highest authorities in Ecuador. They will gather at midnight in the government palace. So it's all for now. We, we will keep you posted with more information as soon as we can. Back to you at the studio. Thanks for that, Denise Herrero. During the last day of hearings at the International Court of Justice in The Hague, Chilean President Sebastian Pinera insisted his country will not negotiate sea access with Bolivia. Chile defended the validity of the 1904 treaty in which Bolivia accepted the loss of 400 kilometers of coastline. The International Court of Justice will now deliberate, but its verdict may only come at the end of this year. Bolivia wants Chile to cede almost every human right. And our correspondent in Bolivia, Freddy Morales, has more details. The Bolivian government considers that Chile has not undermined any of their arguments presented to the Court of The Hague. President Evo Morales said that Chile failed to mention the core of the problem, which is the invasion of 1879 and the 120 square kilometers that gave sea access to Bolivia. He pointed out Chile's insistence on talking about the agreement of 1904, which Bolivia does not accept. The Chilean authorities say that they are good neighbors to Bolivia, President Morales pointed out some facts. The commitment of free port access to Bolivian cargo is not being fulfilled because Chile privatized the port's administration. Between 2010 and 2015, in Chile, there were 141 strike days in the ports, causing losses for Bolivia of $1 million every day. And between 2015 and 2016, there were another 42 strike days at Chile's customs. Since last year, Bolivian diplomats have been denied Chilean visas. Bolivia and Chile must now wait for a decision, and this could happen by the end of this year. The Russian Cryptocurrency and Blockchain Association recognized Venezuela and President Nicolas Maduro as pioneers in creating and implementing the Petro, the first commodity-secured cryptocurrency. The award was received by the Venezuelan ambassador to Moscow, Carlos Ferra. President Maduro was recognized as the first president who dared to implement the first national digital currency and for backing the new currency by the country's oil and gold reserves. Well, time now for a short break, but join us again after a look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting.
Welcome back. The caravan of the former Brazilian president, Lula da Silva, has reached its final stage in the southern city of Curitiba. Supporters have turned out in force to welcome the former president, who is due to speak shortly. Lula's caravan or campaign tour has been crisscrossing the country as he remains the favorite to win October's presidential election. But it also comes as Brazilian courts are about to decide whether to send him to prison for alleged corruption, which could prevent him from standing. Now, this follows last night's attack on the campaign caravan. Three shots were fired at the buses in the convoy, although no one was injured. The attack occurred when the buses were traveling between towns in the south of the country. Party leader Galisi Hoffman said two shots hit a bus carrying reporters following Lula's presidential campaign tour, and a third shot hit another vehicle. But the bus carrying Lula was the only one that was not hit. People are scared, and with good reason. We think this is something unheard of. We never expected this level of violence. The violence against the caravan has increased. We have alerted authorities. Our correspondent Andrew Vieira has been with the caravan, and he sent this report. The Lula for Brazil caravan has come to an end one day after the troublesome events of Tuesday mainly an assassination attempt against former President Lula and those joining him in his caravan. Today's event is a celebration of democracy and a denunciation of the growth of fascism in Brazil. For this, Lula will be joined by left-wing candidates and social movements for a multi-party event against the far-right, in particular against the far-right candidate who today, after the failed assassination attempt against Lula, arrived at an airport to incite violence against the populist candidate, at one point holding up the head of a dummy made to resemble Lula. In spite of these attacks, what this caravan has left us with is that Lula was able to speak directly to the people. He's been greeted by thousands of people at every stop. Once again, he's shown he's the main political leader in Brazil and one of the most important leaders across the world. Today's event will reinforce the strength of the Brazilian left and continue the conversation regarding Latin American integration. And Venezuela has condemned the violence directed at the former Brazilian president, Lula's caravan, and particularly the armed attacks carried out by militias on two vehicles belonging to the caravan during its travels through the state of Ferrano. In a communique, the Venezuelan government declared itself in solidarity with the former president and members of the Workers' Party in their fight for democracy, saying the assailants have clear intentions and seek to impede Lula from his legitimate right to run as a candidate in this year's presidential elections. Chilean President Sebastian Pinera is using anti-terrorism law to target Mapuche indigenous activists who are demanding their land back. Pinera approved a reform in the law which will allow police to use force and to detain the demonstrators. For decades, Mapuche activists have been demanding the return of their land in Bio Bio and Araucania, which was sold to businesses. They have also complained that the region is becoming increasingly militarized. And activists from Chilean pro-choice pro movements have marched outside the Ministry of Health in Santiago against changes to the abortion laws. Protesters launched insults at the current right-wing government of Sebastian Pinera, accusing them of restricting reproductive rights for women. The Ministry of Health recently published new guidelines giving health professionals and institutions greater powers to object to abortions for reasons of conscience. Haitian President Jovenel Moyes has sworn in members of the High Military Command, that's the newly reconstituted National Army. The Caribbean nation has not had a military since 1995, when former President Jean Bouchard Aristide disbanded the army after returning to power following a coup. President Moyes has pledged to restore citizens' trust in the state institution, pledging that the army will respect the rule of law and will strive to serve the people. They will also be tasked with cybersecurity and efforts to combat climate change. 
Jamaica has extended the state of emergency in the St. Catherine North area in a bid to quell criminal activity. The measure was introduced in mid-March after 48 people were killed in under three months. Prime Minister Andrew Holness said the government will detail its crime plan soon. He said the pl plans must have bipartisan backing and it must give authorities enhanced powers in the name of national security. A survey shows that the majority of Jamaicans would support the temporary suspension of citizens' rights and acceptance of military rule if it was to curtail crime. And just days after Antigua and Barbuda's general election, where the Antigua and Barbuda Labour Party, the ABLP, defeated the United Progressive Party, the UPP, UPP leader Harold Lovell says he's not opposed to a merger with the breakaway party, the Democratic National Alliance. The DNA was formed after John Messiah left the UPP last year. Now, Lovell did not mention if he had already made an official approach to the DNA, and Messiah hasn't said if she'd be willing to go back to the party that she left. The Cambridge Analytical scandal continues to make waves throughout the world. Trinidad and Tobago's Attorney General is launching a formal, invest formal investigation into reports that the former administration of the People's Partnership used the company's services for their election campaign. Whistleblower Christopher Wiley, who is the company's former director of research, testified in London that Trinidad and Tobago was used as a data mining test project in 2013 under the government of Kamala Prasad Basissa. Wiley has said that the data acquisition in Trinidad and Tobago is and was illegal and that there was total disregard for the law. Truth. Attorney General Faris al Rawi says his office will launch a broad investigation to see how far Truth. the data breaches went from then until the end of the election in 2015. Um, in... Madam Speaker, in the election campaign of 2015, citizens will recall there were wide-scale receipts of unsolicited, personalized political messaging from entities promoting the United National Congress. It is therefore incumbent upon the Office of the Attorney General in discharging duties under the Constitution of Trinidad and Tobago to cause an audit of all government ministries, statutory authorities, state enterprises, and the National Security Council to ascertain whether any contracts were established, whether any payments were made, and whether any services were rendered by the named companies Cambridge Analytica, Aggregate IQ, and the Strategic Communication Laboratories Group, and or any of their affiliate alter ego companies or entities. In Haiti, hundreds have marched in the streets of Port-au-Prince to demand the authorities to do more to find a journalist who's been missing for almost two weeks. Vladimir de Gagnier di disappeared on March 14th while on assignment in Grand Ravine, a gang-ridden neighborhood of the capital. His wife, Florette Guerreria, says she has done everything possible to find him, but that the authorities have done little to help. She filed a missing persons report with Haiti's investigative police on March 16th, and said she's never heard back. We communicated with the authorities. It's them who are responsible for carrying out the investigations. How is it that there are no elements or clues if they are responsible for the security of the population? A congressman in Peru was slapped in the face during a television interview outside of the Peruvian presidential palace. Guido Lombardi of the Popular Christian Party, who heads the Committee on Economics, Banking and Finance, was asked how much money he has, to which the congressman replied a lot before getting slapped in the face by the unidentified woman. In a tweet, the congressman responded to the media clamor saying that he would not be taking legal action, calling the person who slapped him disturbed. We're going to take a short break now, but join us again after a look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting.
Welcome back. On June 14, 2017, Grenfell Tower, a 24-story apartment block in West London, caught fire. According to official figures, 72 people died in the fire. More than nine months since the tragedy, the local community continues to organize in the fight for justice. And our correspondent in Love, London, Pablo Navarati, has more. On the same night that Grenfell Tower went up in flames, killing at least 72 people, musician and community leader Niles Hailstones was preparing for an event marking 40 years since the release of Bob Marley's Exodus album. He had the keys to Bay 56 in Acklam Village, West London, a short walk away. And the catalyst for us being here now, 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 is actually when Grenfell happened, because we moved into this bay on the 14th of June because donations were being left on the street, they were being stolen and taken out of the area by different bodies, and we decided on the day to use this building to store the donations in and to also be able to assist the community in other ways. The United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Right to Adequate Housing has said the UK government may have failed to comply with its international human rights obligations over the Grenfell Tower fire. More than nine months since the fire, Niles and many others in the community are also very critical of the government's response. But they see hope in how the community has come together. From the 14th of June, a lot of people woke up to what was going on. A lot of people, the majority of people genuinely came out just, you know, or spontaneous to see whatever they could do to help. That initial energy was, a, was an amazing thing, it was a beautiful thing to see. The coming together of the local community in the face of such a brutal tragedy has also encouraged relatives of some of the people who died to demand change. Well, I just ask for people to treat people like human beings and have some compassion and empathy so that this just cover up job and make excuses. I think policies, social policies need to be reviewed. There is widespread frustration and anger amongst the local community towards the British government and local authorities for the way in which they have responded to what people feel was an entirely preventable tragedy. There's a phrase that I think encapsulates what, Gren what led to Grenfell and it's callous indifference. Callous indifference is the way, way that neoliberalism unpeoples individuals uh, and renders them uh, a statistic on a spreadsheet at best and something that can be moved, displaced, decanted, moved out of their place of residency. The communities that live in the shadow of Grenfell Tower have shown a commitment to organise and demand answers in the face of a seeming indifference by the UK government and local authorities. Their search for justice and the truth continues. Pablo Navaretti, Telesur, London. And time now for a look at some of the other stories making headlines around the world. A recent surge in violence in Congo's northeastern province of Ituri has forced more than 60,000 people to flee the area and seek shelter. Refugee camps provide shelter and food and try to prevent malnutrition or the spread of disease. After 15 years of peace, violence has erupted between Lendu and Hema ethnic groups, driven in part by a breakdown of government authority. Hundreds of people have taken to the streets of the Ghanaian capital, Accra, to protest against a military deal with Washington, which was passed by Parliament last week. The agreement was approved by President Nana Akufo Addo's government, but has come under heavy criticism from the opposition, who say it undermines the country's sovereignty. America has interest in our oil. They will bring their warships to our sea. They will control our naval bases. Our Navy will not be able to check what they are taking out of our shores. They will take our oil away. Akufuado has sold our sovereignty for a mere $20 million. The National Police of Spain have dismantled a criminal network in Barcelona that sold stolen art from Libya to finance the self-proclaimed Islamic State. Two art collectors acquired and sold works of historical and archaeological value from territories controlled by the extremist group. The European Commission will introduce measures to crack down on the trafficking of cultural goods as part of an effort to cut funding for terrorist groups. And finally, a Pakistani TV channel has put the country's first transgender news activist on the air, a watershed cultural moment for the marginalized community in the deeply conservative country. Mavia Malik, a former model, appeared on the channel Kohinoor for the first time last Friday. 
In 2009, Pakistan became one of the first countries in the world to legally recognize a third gender, third sex actually, and last year the first transgender passport was issued. Well, that story brings us to the, e the end of this news brief. But for these and many other stories, you can find them on our website at tellusyourtv.net forward slash English. And as we go, we leave you with live pictures from the closing rally of Lula da Silva's campaign in the Brazilian city of Curitiba. So for Tell Us Your English, I'm Sweeney Gray. Thank you so much for watching. <laughs> Yeah.